The name of the series is uh, Jews and Lithuanians, Glory, Horror, and Revisionist History. We're going to be concentrating on the last of that. Tonight is the seventh of seven lectures, the last lecture, seven out of seven lectures. And uh, the title of tonight's talk is The Challenge of an Impossible Past, Jews and Lithuanians After the Holocaust. As you see, our sponsors tonight are my good friends, the Edelmans, Dr. and Mrs. Edelman, in memory of Rabbi Cosman, Rabbi Mrs. Cosman, from Frederick, of course, who brought Torah to so many families. If anything, that's an understatement. <laughs> Very honored. And by the Strulowitz family from Lakewood. And um, in general, I w we want to thank all the sponsors for the two lecture series that we're in this summer. Obviously, without them, you would not be listening to this. Now, without any further ado, I'll proceed to the body of my remarks. So again, this is the last seventh lecture, and we're going to post-World War II. And I begin, when I left off last time, in 1944, when the Russian army conquered most of Lithuania, back from the Germans in July and August of 44. As you see in the first um, slide over here, that's the uh, Russian front, and it's the second half, the first half Hitler won, and then the second half Stalin won, and that's why all the arrows are pointing towards Germany. And if you look, what is it, the sky blue, is that what it is over there? You'll see that in a certain series of offensive, it's in 1944, continuous fighting, the Russians broke, to, broke into and, and took over a good chunk of Lithuania. Uh, now, as I said, the few Jews that were left, what we call the Sher Sapleta, were happy, if also sad. They're happy the Russians are here, the Germans are gone. They're sad because everybody else was dead. All their family was dead. And so as you see in the second the picture over here, to the Jews, the picture of the Russian army approaching, as you see in the upper left-hand side, was uh, uh, angels of mercy, as it were, right? And you see the survivors hugging and greeting each other. They made it through the war. And in the upper right side, you see in Vilna, they're having a ceremony to say Kaddish for the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands that were martyred. This only happened because the Russian army came back in. Now, most of these Jews will end up living under Stalin until May of 45 when the war's over. And then they'll try to get the heck out of there, which was actually possible in the fluid situation, the fluid conditions of post-war 1945-1946 when Stalin's borders were still permeable and things weren't hard and fast. And so those who were nimble could get out of Russia, at least could get out of Lithuania and those kind of places, to the West, and did so. After 1946, the Iron Curtain will come down, and then nobody can leave. And so you see in the next slide the um, examples of Rabbi uh, Matopo Gromansky and others who survived the Kovna Ghetto, believe it or not, a few survivors, and then they run away to France as soon as, as, soon as they can. Because you can't live as a Jew under Stalin. The losers are the ones who don't go, the Jews who remain behind, who do not have the energy or the opportunity to leave, and so they will remain behind in Lithuania. Looking at neighbors and others who murdered their family and so forth, few in number these Jews, weak in culture, and they will remain behind for a lousy Jewish existence. For the Lithuanians, the arrival of the Soviets was their worst nightmare. The Lithuanians hate communism. They hate Russians and they hate Stalin. Well, guess what? Let's go to the next one. Stalin hates them. <laughs> Matter of fact, he hates them all, the Lithuanians, for a whole bunch of reasons, especially because they know they're so anti-communist and so Catholic and so un-Russian and so forth. And Stalin realizes something the Lithuanians do not. Stalin knows that no one will stop him from re-annexing Lithuania and doing whatever he wants there. The Lithuanians had hoped that just as after the First World War, they had been granted their independence by the international community as represented in the League of Nations at that time, mainly through support of the Western powers. So, too, they hoped that after the Second World War, somehow or other, Lithuania will be granted independence once again by the successor of the League of Nations, the New United Nations, which represents the civilized world. They were totally mistaken. Roosevelt, FDR, and Churchill had already secretly conceded Lithuania to Stalin 
back in 42, the beginning of the war. Okay, let's go to the next one. Read this. And by 43, Roosevelt had consigned. In other words, this is in the middle of World War II. He just didn't want people to know about it. Roosevelt had already consigned the Baltic states and Eastern Europe to Stalin. Meeting with Cardinal Spellman in New York in September of 43, FDR said the European people will simply have to endure Russian domination in the hope that in 10 or 20 years they will be able to live well with the Russians. Imagine if you're an East European. Meeting with Stalin in Tehran in 43, Roosevelt said, this is what he said to Stalin in the middle of the war, but it was not for publication, that Roosevelt fully realized the three Baltic republics had in history and more recently been part of Russia, and when the Russian armies reoccupied these areas, he was not going to go to war over this point. So the Lithuanians had no idea that this was in the cards, but my friends, it was. Okay? Now, so therefore, Stalin could torture, kill, collectivize, and deport to his heart's content, which he ruthlessly did. And he did it, I mean, to hundreds of thousands, I repeat, hundreds of thousands of Lithuanians out of a total population of 2 million, a little around that. And nobody in the world said boo. I don't think anybody in the world knew about this, except for a few specialists, okay? So let's go to the next one. Lithuanians simply didn't know that at the Tehran conference on the right and at the Alta conference on the left, it was just a double push it. So although the United States did not recognize the legality in international law, of annexing the Baltic states of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia. They had what they called the Sumner Wells Declaration by the under tax Secretary of State, which said the, the United States regards this as illegal, but that's it. De facto, in point of everyday business, it's part of Russia, and get over it, okay? Now, for the Lithuanians, this was too bad to be true. As a result, tens of thousands of Lithuanians, after the war, ran away to the forest and became guerrillas, partisans, terrorists, whatever you want to call them. They call themselves the Forest Brothers. And they fought the Russians for 10 years. I don't think anybody even knows about this. Stalin had to wage a big set of wars after World War II was over inside the USSR in the newly conquered territories to suppress uprisings against him by the Ukrainians, the Lithuanians, Latvians, Estonians, and maybe a few others. Right? Now, Stalin was so clever... He was able to keep the news of this away from the public. And therefore, nobody said anything about Russia suppressing its own people or anything like that. They, they were not able to get away with it. But the whole Parsha, that the people over there, like the Lithuanians, know. take a look at this little video for a second. I'll give you the basic facts. Of course, the Germans were eventually repulsed back towards Berlin. And by 1944, the Soviets had managed to reimpose their control over the Baltic countries. By 1946, the so-called Iron Curtain had descended across Europe, leaving the people of the Baltics at the mercy of Joseph Stalin, who quickly proved yet again his willingness to be a brutal ruler. The General Secretary viewed his newly acquired territories as a distinctly unreliable land, full of Nazi collaborators and Western sympathizers. To that regard, he ordered a harsh Sovietization policy towards the region. Deportations of native Balts to Siberia and Central Asia became the new order of the day. This policy had actually begun back in 1941, but the largest waves of forced immigration occurred in 1948, 1949, and 1951. The idea was to target natural leaders in government, economics, education, and replace them with pro-Soviet stooges. In addition, the seizure of lands allowed Russian colonists to move in and replace the native population, further pacifying this fringe territory bordering the ever-menacing West. These deportations saw entire communities torn apart and families ripped away from lands they had inhabited for centuries. Over the years, anywhere between 200,000 to 400,000 individuals were expelled. However, rather than pacifying the land like he had hoped, Stalin's impositions had provided further impetus for Baltic natives to take up arms against him. The people of the Baltics had little hope of winning a total war against the Soviet superpower. But in a region naturally dominated by boreal forests, there remained plenty of wilderness in which guerrilla fighters could hide and then strike from the shadows. 
The infrastructure to support such a thing had existed since the early days of the Second World War. In Lithuania, many military-aged men had fled into their country's ample woodlands to avoid German conscription. And then they armed themselves with the weapons the Nazis left behind on their hasty retreat from the Red Army in 1944. Over time, what began as a hodgepodge of disparate fugitives evolved into a large and somewhat organized resistance front as more and more souls poured into the forests to take up arms against the Soviets. These men had hope in their hearts as they had seen how Finland had managed to humiliate the Russians in the Winter War and sought to do now the same themselves. Eventually, these wilderness warriors became grouped together by the general public under a generic title, the Forest Brothers. Between 1945 and 1952, over 100,000 Lithuanians participated in the guerrilla war, with another 40,000 joining the struggle in Latvia and 30,000 in Estonia, either as secret collaborators or active fighters. Life as a forest brother was harsh. The wilderness of Northern Europe was an unforgiving climate where the slightest slip-up would likely lead to discovery and annihilation by Soviet forces. The partisans lived mainly in underground bunkers, which could range from squalid foxholes to multi-layered complexes. Supplies were a constant problem. There was no access to proper medicine, so wounds and sickness often led to death. The partisans relied almost entirely on capturing enemy weapons to arm themselves, and they were perpetually short on ammunition. Food was scarce and had to be acquired from nearby villages, friendly to the cause, at risk of brutal reprisal if the Soviets found out. So this gives you a little bit of an idea, which I don't think most people are aware of. There's not much of a war going on in 45 to 55, something like that. And by the way, if you're Jewish, where do you stand on this? In other words, what were you, what, uh, how, how were you treated? But in Stalin, the Lithuanians were messing with the wrong guy. You know how to play hardball. If I even suspect that you're a member of any of these groups, I'll kill your wife, your family, your children. I burn them down. I send them to Siberia. I wipe out the whole village. You know, you're messing with the wrong guy. Aside from the usual tortures and killings of family members, plus his spies, you know, the British sent uh, men to help the, uh, the, the partisans, but Kim Philby was the Stalin spy, the head of the British Secret Service, and he gave all the names away, so they were all killed by the Russians. Stalin moved thousands of Russians themselves into uh, Lithuania to make the Russians a majority inside Lithuania. By 1953, Stalin had won. Both sides had lost 40,000 killed, and 20% of Lithuanians were in Siberia and similar places. Crushed, the Lithuanians were resigned to sullen obedience from 1953 to 1989. They were simply under Russian dictatorship and they had to toe the line. Though everyone knew that they hated it, they had to pretend that they loved the USSR. But everyone knew that there were half a million Lithuanians in the US and elsewhere, half a million, who kept up the native traditions and gave expression to the fact that Lithuania was enslaved. Let's go to the next one. If you're old enough, you may possibly remember they used to have something called the Captive Nations Resolution. That's Sumner Wells on the left-hand side. The Under Secretary of State says the United States does not recognize this. And the Congress every year used to pass a, revolution, a resolution condemning Russia as imperial power and enslaving the peoples of Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, Ukraine, etc. And boy, did the Russians hate this. But there's Ronald Reagan having a ball. There's Eisenhower signing. They used to sign every year. So the reason I'm going through all this is to tell you that post-World War II, the Soviet rule in Lithuania was experienced by the Lithuanians as a horrible time. What about the Jews in Lithuania? Who was left? Now, here we're dealing with a real bunch of momsers. Listen to this. Um, on June thir July 13, 44, the Red Army under General So-and-so marched in Lithuania. The surviving remnants of a once proud Jewish community emerged from their hiding places in the forest to return home. Lithuania had begun the war with more than 200,000 and were only left with about, you know, 1,700, 1,800 in Vilna, altogether 700, altogether in Kovna from 25,000 and 200 in Shavl from 8 or 9,000. They were joined by some Jews returning from exile with the Russian army, which had said how uh, Lithuanian Jews, these survivors, 
these are Jews who survived World War II, were met with undisguised hostility on the part of their former Lithuanian neighbors who had taken possession of Jewish property and goods in the belief and expectation and the hope that their legal owners had perished. These Lithuanians were disappointed to see that some Jews had survived. They refused to vacate the homes that they had inherited <laughs> or to return the valuables that their former Jewish neighbors or friends had left them for self-keeping, for safekeeping. I'm sorry, right? And uh, anyway, you get the idea. But I'll tell you a little more. This overt antagonism and the Jews' inability to recover their possessions induced many survivors and returnees to emigrate. That's what I would have done. Returnees who decided to stay found it difficult to get bread rations that the Red Army arranged for the civilian population. The Lithuanians in charge refused to give bread to the surviving Jews. A newly organized Jewish committee had to petition the Red Army. Another problem was to arrange proper burial for Jewish corpses or body parts left unburied after the bunkers were detonated. Searchers in the Ninth Fort, which is where they shot everybody in Kovna, found box, piles of bones and mountains of ashes, remains of the bodies that the Germans had exhumed from the mass graves and set a fire, trying to erase all evidence of their crimes. These bones were buried in mass graves. Heart-rending scenes took place when relatives of parents who had perished arrived to claim Jewish children who had been left behind in private Lithuanian homes or in the care of church and secular institutions. Many of these children had been baptized by their foster parents and refused to accompany their Jewish relatives whom they no longer recognized. The religious institutions, meaning the Christian ones, were especially reluctant to surrender children for whom they had cared and to become attached. The bishop, Adamitsvius, expressing church policy, rejected all pleas to help locate the children or release them when they were found or identified. Thus, most of the several hundred Jewish children who survived the Holocaust were lost to the Jewish people. So if we go to Lithuania today, you may find people who are 100% not Jewish, but actually that's not true. <laughs> they are, you know, they, they, if, if you scratch a little, you'll find out they're the kids or the children of the kids by now, or grandchildren, who survived the Second World War. I'm just trying to tell you what was left after the war. Eventually, a few other Jews moved to Lithuania during the Soviet period from elsewhere because of the uh, uh, industrialization that took place under the Russians. But bo bottom line is, the Jews now, after the Second World War, in Lithuania, living in a Jewish cemetery. I was there myself. You, you feel it. It's a Jewish cemetery. Lithuanian Jewry, therefore, in 1945 to 1990, was a pale imitation, a ghost. I, I can illustrate this with a story. There was a guy in Baltimore, maybe you remember him, one of these Ruskies, Russian Jews that came over, and he died already. I think his name was Natis or something like that. He used to hang around Shomri. And you know these Russians with an attitude. And turns out, I got to speak to him in Yiddish and so forth. Turns out, I think he was, I believe he was in Vilna or Kovna. He had a real Lithuanian Yiddish. And he'd been a communist and all that stuff. But he was a Jew. And he told me with pride that one of the things he and his buddies did was the following. In Russia, no Jewish stuff was allowed to be printed or published, with one exception. The Communist Party newspaper of the Jewish communists, called Sovetish Heimland, the Soviet homeland. Now this was something in Hebrew, le in Hebrew characters, in Yiddish, it's a Soviet Yiddish, as I'll explain in a second. And it was pure communist propaganda. There was nothing Jewish in it whatsoever. Pure communist propaganda. I mean, it's amazing. They used to have an Hebrew college. And only, but it is in, in Yiddish language and Hebrew characters. You understand? So by the standards of the desert that was Soviet Lithuania, it's something Jewish. And the problem is that the communists themselves in Moscow were already saying, eh, enough with the Yiddish paper. Nobody's reading Yiddish and we're Let's uh, do away with it. And he and his friends knew that not many people go and buy the paper. And so what they would do is every time the paper came out in the, in the uh, you know, kiosk, they would go and buy all the copies to make it seem like there's a, uh, a demand. You know, so they would go buy all the copies. Uh, he was telling me this with pride. This was his bit for Ju Judaism and Jewish culture in the Soviet Union. Now, the truth of the matter is I understand the sentiment, but the nobility of it mixed together with the... Uh, farcical and tragic nature of it 
it deserves a, a, a movie or something like that. That's what Jewish life was and wasn't under the Soviet Union in, in Vilna and Kovna, which had been storied Jewish history, but not anymore. Now, by the way, the Soviets, Jewish comments were really stupid. Go to the next one. If you read the Yiddish paper, you know, they have this funny Yiddish orthography. They want to make, the, the communists were determined to, to establish the point that Yiddish, and not Hebrew, Yiddish has no connection with Hebrew, no connection with Judaism as a religion. It's a language of Jewish working masses in Eastern Europe, which is not. And in order to prove it, look at this. The real word you spell, how do you say truth in Yiddish? Emes, the same like a Hebrew word. There are tons of words in Yiddish that are Hebrew words. That's what Yiddish is. It's some German and other junk like that. And a lot of Hebrew words. In fact, I'll tell you something else. There's a lot of Aramaic words from the Gemara. The, the real Yiddish. The real Yiddish. Not the American stupid, the Borscht Belt. I'm talking about the real Yiddish. Now, how do you say truth? You say MS. How do you write MS in Hebrew? Like you see in front of you, MS. The word is actually MS. But in Ashkenazi, you say MS. How would you write in Yiddish? Off himself, like you see the first one. How do you write in, in Soviet uh, Yiddish? Like you see b the, below. I am M, I am Samach. Should lo have no resemblance whatsoever to the Hebrew. You get it? That's how stupid they were. Okay, anyway. So a desiccated Lithuanian Jewry inside Soviet Lithuania lived in the midst of a truncated Lithuanian national group for a generation or two. The communist regime in Lithuania won whatever popularity it won by being anti-Semitic, by showing it could be as lousy to the Jews and Jewish culture. Every time they would deny a Jew a job or get rid of a Jewish synagogue or something like that, that's something that the broad public, the guy liked. Take a look at the next one. So here's a great uh, achievement of the uh, communists in, in Lithuania. They blew up. They destroyed the magnificent and famous great synagogue that once upon a time was in Vilna, hundreds and hundreds of years old. You can see a little bit of it. There's a painting, I believe, from somebody who's not Jewish. And Khrushchev uh, destroyed it. Okay? And to just give you a little bit of an idea, go to the next one. Great synagogue of Vilna, which once stood at the end of the street, was built between 1630 and 1633, meaning in the old days of the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, when the Jews had a good baby. After permission was granted to construct the synagogue from stone, standing on a spot built in 1572, see so the original shul had been in 1572, and the original original was in 1440. So when you went and dove in that shul 100 years ago, you went in the shul, they went back to the 15th century. The interior was redesigned in the mid-18th century. I'm just trying to show you, the Jews in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania had it good. It was redesigned by a Lithuanian German from Vilna called Johann Christen Galbitz, though it's not Jewish, in the Italian Renaissance style. Four mass this is the, the show. Four massive equidistant columns supported the vast stone floored pile, and within them a three tiered ornate Rococo uh, bima with a cupola so with eight small columns that was built in the second half of the 18th century by so and so. In other words, it was fancy, delish fancy, and could compete with any building. And this is something that Khrushchev just got rid of because he was a real son of a gun and hated the Jews and tried to erase and the Lithuanians approved of this. Okay? So it was an architectural agenda they got rid of. The regime, this communist regime, mothballs, all Jewish books, manuscripts, anything. Now, what was left from Lithu Lithuania? Lithuania, whatever these places, they had tons of Svarim, Kisra Yad, Sefer Torahs, who knows what? Pinkus Akahals, you know, re re records from the communities, and all different chevres. It's an unbelievable amount of stuff. It's all put away in, um, what do you call it, archives and the back of churches that have been converted into government uh, uh, storage buildings, warehouses. Basically, they did them like they do in the last scene of the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Take a look at the next one. Here's two books recently came out to discuss this. If you're interested in the subject, one's by Professor Schiffman about the book smugglers. I remember he said they had to come in the, when, in, later in the 90s and discover these priceless Hebrew things, in, you know, in, in, like I say, in, in the back of some dumb building. And our own Dan Rabinowitz here from Baltimore, and now Silver Spring wrote a book recently on what happened to the famous Strassen Library, very famous uh, Hebrew library in, in Vilna, what the Russians and the Germans did to it. So in other words, the communists were bad news. Thus, the history of Jews and, Lithu and Lithuanians in Lithuania and Belarus because that's all parts of Lithuania. In 1945 to 1990 is a dark and gray story. Even the revival of Zionist feeling that takes place among Soviet Jewry 
starting in the 60s and afterwards, the refusings really bypassed Lithuania a lot. Most of it was in Latvia, interestingly, and in Russia, Moscow, Leningrad, Kiev, places like that. Not so much Lithuania, as far as I remember. So let us turn away now from the physical uh, geographical Lithuania for a half century. And let us turn to the Lithuanian Jewish diaspora in the West. These are the Jews who moved in millions prior to Hitler and got away. These are your parents and grandparents and great-grandparents, many of you listening today. And they moved all over the West. America, Canada, England, South Africa, Western Europe, Palestine. What happened to them in the second half after World War II? Overall, the Lithuanian Jewish diaspora prospered in the West, but in a complex way. Politically and economically, the descendants of the Great Emigration from 1880 to 1930, 1940, the descendants did very well, taking advantage of the educational opportunities to advance themselves, better themselves, and broadly enter the middle class and even the upper middle class and wealthy class during the great prosperity that characterized 1945 to 1990. This is when Western uh, societies really took off economically. That's economically and politically. How about Jewishly? In terms of Judaism and Jewish culture, Zionism, things like that. Here we have, and I've spoken about this in my Saturday night speeches over the years, here we have a story of disintegration. The older generation kept up the Litvish Jewish culture to some degree, that's your bubbies, but their children and grandchildren assimilated, losing their specific Litvish identity. Become American. A lot of boys running around in Baltimore or elsewhere. If you trace them back, well, they're really uh, from Jews and all this stuff. Jewish Jews back in the old country. We all know this is part of, of the world we live in. A good measure of what I'm talking about would be the fate of Yiddish. Let's go to the next one. The greatest of the Yiddish writers in the last hundred years is obviously Chaim Grada, who's from Vilna and writes these wonderful, remarkable novels, most of them translated from the Yiddish into English, about life in the 20s and 30s, actually, when he lived there. Uh, a brilliant novelist, but he's a Yiddish writer. And so he survived the war. And I would say from 1949 till his death in the 80s, he would go around all over the world to specific places and give these talks in Yiddish to an ever-shrinking audience of older and older people. <laughs> right? New York, Toronto and Montreal, South America, I don't know, you know, Europe, a place like that. Who's going out to hear Yiddish? Uh, a speaker, that's my point. Right? Even though you don't have to be religious, the obvious is he's a secular. So why don't you go to see the greatest living uh, remnant of the once vibrant secular uh, Jewish and Yiddish culture in Lithuania? Who's going to that? My kids aren't interested. Your kids aren't interested. See what I'm saying? That's my point. So you have the interesting phenomenon of the years from 1945 to 90, characterized by an increasingly aging generation in the West, including Israel who maintain some uh, connection with the specifically Lithuanian Jewish culture, secular culture, in its Hebraist and Yiddishist manifestations, but not being able to interest their own children and grandchildren in them, and thereby guaranteeing its ultimate disappearance. The only exception I can think of are your weirdo academic types. You know, university professors in Yiddish and a few students are into that. That's a very small group. What about Judaism, not Jewish culture? Here we have Lithuanian Judaism. How does Lithuanian Judaism fare in the post-World War II era? Here we have a different and complex story. Lithuanian religious culture flourished in an unexpected way in the second half of the 20th century. Indeed, the Jewish religious culture of Lithuania, and I speak now of well, the Grand Duchy, no, the Lithuanian Belarus, uh, kind of exploded in Western locales, and in terms of sociology, came to be identified as two, the two, most dynamic trends in modern Judaism, by which I mean a Judaism that is successfully transmitted to the next generation, as opposed, for example, as I said, Yiddishism, which isn't. The two faces of the Litvish, again, I'm saying Lithuanian Belarus, the two faces of this Litvish Judaism 
in the second half of the 20th century, obviously are the Lithuanian yeshivas and Chabad. Let's take a look at Lithuanian yeshivas. For a whole bunch of reasons, and I've discussed this extensively in the past, I'm not going to do so now, Lithuanian yeshivas, after 1945, became the only institutions religious to attract the youth, at least a segment, a growing segment, and to retain them in adulthood. It's quite a statement I just made. You ponder what I just said. I'll repeat. It became the only institutions able to attract the youth and retain them in adulthood. In the course of this development, the yeshivas spawned all kinds of institutions that didn't exist before. Day schools for boys and girls, yeshivas and kolels for guys, seminaries for girls, and whole communities. That's the reality you and I are living in now. Like Baltimore and Lakewood, and the Israeli counterparts, and Gateshead in England, places like that. For adults, communities for adults. This never existed, but these are all literature for things. And a great variety of these types of institutions exist. You got your Kippas Ruga Yeshiva, you got your Wayu, you got your Baal Shubi Yeshivas now, and all kinds. This is a basic sociological fact which stands out against a background of the decadence, decline, and disintegration of the other forms of Judaism. That's a plain sociological statement. The Yeshivas were founded by Lithuanian rabbis as Yiddish speaking, totalizing environments of Gemara, Gemara, Gemara. And that's all they do. Institutions committed to an education both fundamentalist and sophisticated, quite in opposition to modernity and utterly disdainful of any other form of Judaism or Jewish culture. And therefore, here's just a few. I could put 50 pictures here, couldn't I? What do you all have in common? Rabbi uh, Baron Cutler, Moshe Feinstein, Rabbi Utner, Panovich, Rabbi Salvechi, Rabbi Rudiman, and many others. They're born in Lithuania, Lithuania, Belarus. They're born in Lithuania, they're Yiddish speaking, right? And they have a certain, they have a Litvish charisma. They're not Hasidic rabbis or anything like that, right? So, so wherein lies the charisma? What is that? But they're charismatic because they draw the youth, a segment of youth, and later that segment grows. That's where we are today. Right? Now, um, this is an entire subculture of institutions and communities today who self define as Litvish. <laughs> they see themselves as the latest link in a chain of Lithuanian Judaism. The Nazis killed the people, but the Judaism lives on. Same thing more so in Israel. They have, enti- they have a, a political party array. Entire sectors in Yerushalayim and Bnei Brak, and now whole new cities, as we all know. What do you call it? Kiryat Sefer and, excuse me, and these other things. It's, this is a very vibrant culture. Listen, I don't know if you notice what's going on around you. New yeshivas are opening up all the time. New books are coming out all the time. In Lakewood, for example, every year they have to add new schools. New elementary schools, new high schools. they got a, a baby boom explosion. Along, and same thing in Israel. Alongside this, no, this, that's, that's one phenomenon. Parallel to this, not the same line parallel, Chabad, Lubavitch, <laughs> right? Let's go to the next one. Lubavitch is a town in Lithuania, or in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, it's in Belarus. But it's not far away from the places we've been talking about. Minsk, um, Vilna, and so forth. Uh, what it, these are, the Rebbe's, are Lithuanian Jews. Now, they're the Hasidic variety, not the Misnagdic. I get that. But it's a very distinctive form of Hasidism. And, as we all know, Lepavich also, especially under the leadership of the Menachem Endel Schneerson, uh, exploded and spread all over the world till they're everywhere and growing now. And, uh, and uh, what's the right word? Converting people uh, to Chabad all the time. Uh, there aren't other movements out there that are doing this. You got the Yeshivas, you got Chabad. That's what I can think of in Judaism. And they're all Litvish. They're all from Lithuania. Didn't come out of Germany, didn't come out of Hungary, didn't come out of Italy, and uh, so on and so forth. It's just very interesting in that regard. So, um, and by the way, Lubavitch still keeps up to Belarusian Yiddish. You know, uh, not, and O is an A, you know, like Teiro, that kind of thing. My point is that in 1945 to 1990, outside of Lithuania, forms of Judaism and Jewish culture that had evolved in Lithuania, flourished everywhere except in Lithuania, Lithuania and Belarus, not under the communists. 
They have flourished in the heart of the modern Western world as a counterculture, which is an impressive statement, an impressive achievement. Do these Jews pay attention to the country of Lithuania? Did they ask what's happened in Lithuania in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s? Did it happen in Soviet Lithuania? Why would they? Who cares? Why would they? It's a slaughterhouse. Did they pay attention to the Holocaust that occurred that I described in my last talk? To the Lithuanian participation in the Holocaust? Here we run into something interesting. Here we run into the subject of the Holocaust and Holocaust memory in postmodern Western culture. A fascinating phenomenon because the Holocaust has come to be, in our lifetime, a constituent element in modernity. That's quite a statement I just made. Modernity has a lot of elements in it, right? Uh, uh, science, rationalism is part of it. Uh, belief in progress, possibly. Holocaust is a, a, a defining part, a central part of the postmodern uh, sensibility. It was very skeptical of progress, you see. Um, it kind of led to postmodernism. I don't, I don't want to get too eggheady on you. But the bottom line is, as we all know, the Holocaust is a big deal in Western culture, I repeat, in Western culture. Now, it took about 15 to 20 years for the Holocaust to enter popular culture. Let's go to the next one. These books came out in the 50s and 60s, right? 10, 15 years after the war. Diary of Frank in the 50s. John Hersey was already 1950. Um, Leon Uris in the 1960 or so. Elie Wiesel in 1960 or so. You know what I mean? It took the original shock war off and they started to have literature. And from then on, it became part of Western culture. As you know, these books, especially Elie Wiesel and Anne Frank, are required reading of public schools around the world, meaning in, in, uh, in the West. In the West. By the 1970s and 80s, it really was hardwired into world culture or Western culture, and not just Jewish culture. All around the world, you have Holocaust memorials. Uh, countries pass Holocaust memory legislation. Uh, it's just interesting, you understand? I'm talking about the memory of the... I'm not talking about the, the Holocaust. I'm talking about the memory of the Holocaust as a constituent uh, part of modern culture. In terms of Western secular culture... The Holocaust was fitted into the new emphasis on racism as the greatest possible sin, which is an interesting phenomenon. The uh, end, of post uh, end of colonialism, the rise of people of color to freedom, and, and in America too, uh, you know, raised the issue of, of racism in the past, and is at this moment that we get these riots going on, people knocking down the statues, and uh, one of the key, are, you know, let's put it this way, from that perspective, the Holocaust is perfect. Here, racism caused extermination of whole people, genocide. You see? But it was all focused. No, it was in popular imagination, in popular culture, in literature, art, movies, and all the rest of it. It was focused on non Lithuanian developments. This is interesting. What were all the books and movies and novels and uh, plays and all the other things all about? Warsaw Ghetto, a lot of that. Anne Frank, a lot of that. Auschwitz and so forth. You know, the gas chambers and all that. None of which had to do with Lithuania, did it, as I explained to you. Right? had nothing to do with that. By contrast, the Lithuanian Jewish Yiddish diaspora responded to the Lithuanian Holocaust with a plethora of memorial books about communities, etc. But these were in Yiddish and Hebrew and le reached a limited audience. I only know about because when I was growing up, a lot of shuls used to have these books lying around. Nobody knew what they were. It's one of the ways I learned Yiddish. And when they had the Hebrew college, as a matter of policy, the Hebrew college, you know, as, as a Jewish library, collected these books Schnippeschick, Pitcheschick, this is it, this, every little town in Lithuania, the, the people who lived in America or Israel or South Africa or South America, usually in Yiddish, sometimes he would write books about their former communities. This is how they kept the memory alive because everybody was exterminated. Yeah, all the living people were dead, except the ones who left earlier, so they wrote all about their memories. There are tons of these books, but they're in Hebrew and Yiddish. Nobody in America ever heard of them. No American Jews ever heard of this stuff. I don't think any, I never heard of American Jew. The red girl, everyday American Jew, whoever would open a book, you know, say for, uh, you know, tells, say for uh, Utian or something like that, you know, when he's a little, um, the, uh, community studies. So the Lithuanian experience that I described to you last week, it was not unknown. The, event, the, the events were plain, and the academic scholars knew all about it. The story's out there, but um, didn't get any play. Moreover, I never saw a movie where anybody discussed the fact that... Before the Germans show up, you're listening to your next-door neighbors, take you out and shoot you, and rape, and this, and that, and the other. Moreover, in general, 
Although the Jews were not the only victims of Hitler, the Jews occupied a large, outsized role in Western culture in the second half of the 20th century. It's a simple fact that Jews are very articulate. And uh, let's put it this way. Literature, journalism, TV, and movies were fields in which Jews were not absent. <laughs> okay? As the decades went by, and the Western world came to be interested in the Holocaust, the Jews dominated the discourse by writing about it and talking about it. More and more books, essays, TV shows, and movies talked about the Jewish Holocaust, which is a big subject. After all, the inhumanity of pure evil fascinates even as it repels. But there were other movies, as you know, there are no movies until maybe very recently about the killing of the gypsies just off the top of my head, you know, for example, right? Uh, or other groups. Not really. The Holocaust, you say the Holocaust, it means the Jews. I repeat, the Jews are not the only victims, but that's what you think about. And they're the biggest. During the 45-year period of 1945 to 90, the Jews had this field to themselves. The Lithuanians, the Poles, the Ukrainians, and the others were muzzled by being under communism. It's kind of funny. Nobody in Eastern Europe, under the communists, put out their memoirs of what it was like to live under Hitler as a Lithuanian, as a Pole, because, <laughs> you know, they only wanted communist propaganda. So they couldn't publish the book. The Soviet and Iron Curtain culture of official denial led to East Europe having no voice whatsoever in the Western cultural treatment of the Holocaust of the Jews. So let's go to the next one. It's notorious then the communist countries, during the years after the Second World War, no, there were no monuments to dead Jews. At the most, there were monuments to Soviet citizens. At the most, monuments to Soviet citizens. They were never said they're Jewish. This is why Yevtushenko over there, the famous Russian dissident writer, with a very famous controversial, um, what is it, a poem called Babi Yar in Russian, in which he said, hey, these guys were Jews. <laughs> yeah. They shot 25, 50,000 whatever Jews. Well, they weren't Ukrainians. They were Jews. And Shostakovich made a, a symphony of it. You know, the 13th Symphony. Uh, he's protesting against the official silence. There on the right hand is Vasily Grossman, I spoke about last year, who wrote these um, war and peace type novels of high quality. Government will let him publish it because it talks about the Jews. Now, the only talk about the Jews is more like Herman Woke. Since the Jews are mentioned there, can't publish it. So that simply means that everybody viewed the Russians as anal, and their whole treatment of the Holocaust as big liars, and there were nobody in the West, which is where all the ideas are, nobody in the West paid any attention to any Soviet writings or Eastern European writings about the Holocaust, so the Jews in the West have the whole field to themselves. You want to talk about the period of Hitler, you want to talk about what life was like, you read a book by Elie Wiesel, by Primo Levi, by Herman Woke, and uh, uh, you know all kind of writers of that sort. You understand? So it's about the Jews at the center of it. And the Jews are the main victims, which they were. Now, meanwhile, uh, let's put it this way. In Lithuania itself, no one gave a damn about the Jews or about their own Lithuanian parents and uncles who had been the good old boys who did the shootings and the killings. Nobody cared about that. The Lithuanians were concerned about their own bad fate and being under the Russians. Deep down, they cultivated to the degree possible their own Lithuanian identity and ancient culture, glorifying themselves, which is understandable given their circumstances. There was, of course, a Lithuanian diaspora in the West of about a million people in America and Western Europe, but their narrative, which downplayed and which justified Jewish suffering, didn't get into general culture. You know, what's published in the Lithuanian community in Chicago, nobody reads it, you know, except you're Lithuanian, you know. They didn't get any, any mainstream treatment. And then, my friends, came 1990 and the unexpected collapse of the USSR and Lithuania regained its independence. And it was a miracle. There was dancing in the streets, as you can imagine. The new Lithuania wanted to integrate in the Western, desperately wanted to integrate in the Western society, in the Western culture. They wanted to get into NATO to prevent the Russians coming back. They're still scared of that. This means you've got to be part of the West. So you've got to now embrace political democracy. No more of that right-wing coup fascist business they had in the 20s and 30s. You've got a political democracy. Done. Lithuania has set up a democratic state with elections. 
This required Western cultural norms. No racism, no one. <laughs> Multiculturalism, gay rights, everything. No anti-Semitism. Really? Uh, that's a no-no in the West. Okay. Whatever. Lithuanians thought. They realized, better not go the anti-Semitism route. Anyway, the Jews are all dead. And the Jews have their own state now in Israel. And the news of Lithuania established good relations with Israel for a whole bunch of reasons. But one, for a whole bunch of reasons. One of them is to show not anti-Semitic, <laughs> right? Get along great with Israel. You're over there, we're over here, that's Kavaldi. Now, the one problem is, or was, and is, how to deal with the events of June to December 1941. What do you do with that? Now, the easiest way, the hardest but easiest way, is to follow the German example. Look at the German, the German said, I guess, we did it, we're wrong, we'll never get over it, we'll pay you money as a, as a Wieder good machen, you know, do the best we can, and we will never stop doing this. Okay? Let's go to the next one. I can tell you right now, Adenauer, Conrad Adenauer, when he started out as head of West Germany, West Germany, in 1949, early 50s, very reluctant to admit the Holocaust. And uh, he didn't want to give money to Israel, any of that kind of stuff. In the end, under pressure from Truman and so forth, Hatchison, so he gave in, and he said Germany is responsible. It wasn't us, but the Third Reich. Basically, he took the following attitude. Suppose my father was a spendthrift and a jerk, and he left me with big debts. Uh, it's not my fault, but you want to know something? I will discharge those debts. That's the attitude he took. He said, it wasn't us Germans, it was somebody else, but we'll pay you the money. As time went on, Adenauer found that actually Germany got a lot of moral credit for this. The world said, like this, very good. You might have. You did the right thing. And uh, they gave Israel all kind of help. And he changed. By the time he said, looked at this Adenauer on the right hand in his old, old age, in his 90s, visiting Israel. And he's a uh, smooching and pooching with Ben Gurion and visited the uh, state book here. Because the hero that generation of Israelis, because he was Moed al -Amis. So that was the easiest way to go. It's difficult, you understand? I never actually found that Germany, and I might point out that Germany did not suffer economically by giving a billion, and eventually many billions, to the Jews, to Israel. They'd given a ton of money to Israel, and Germany still has the best economy in the world. You understand? So it all worked out uh, okay. Uh, and to this day, to this day, so far, I don't know what the future is, Set for the last 70 years, Germany has taken the attitude, we did it, mea culpa, avinu chatanu pashanu, and we'll never get over it. This is just a burden we'll bear. And by saying that, you're liberated. Take a look. This is from Yad Vashem recently, and the German president was there to join in, in the uh, commemoration of Yad Vashem for the Holocaust. And he basically said, listen, we did it. Here's a little clip. Germans deported them. Germans burned numbers on their forearms. Germans tried to dehumanize them, to reduce them to numbers, to erase all memory of them in the extermination camps. They did not succeed. So, there you have This was a few months ago, not long ago at all. And what did he say? We did it. And, and you don't see the world going around saying like this. The Germans are all evil. The world said, I guess, give them credit, because they, they, they manned up to it. Look at the next one. Watch how he's treated. This is it the Yad Vashem? You see that? All the leaders, including Bibi and Rivlin and Putin and Prince Charles, they all, the Yashikaya. You understand why? Because that's the right thing to do. You did it. The German people did it. We all know they did the Holocaust, and we admit it. Now, the liberals in Lithuania, 
may have wanted to do that. But that would mean condemning, as the Germans had to do, their parents, their grandparents, their uncles, and all the others who were the good old boys that did the killing and the, and the mass murders, the shootings of all the Jews. This was uncomfortable for the Lithuanians, to say the least. In addition, the newly independent Lithuania wanted to celebrate their nation in ideal terms. How do you deal with this foul stain? That unfortunately for six months, especially that first week, the twins just go up and murder everybody. Now, a right wing in Lithuanian politics quickly emerged, as is normal in any democratic society. This right wing sought to make this issue of June, December 1941 go away. How do you do that? First of all, you say it didn't happen. Holocaust denial. Or at least it wasn't as widespread as the Jews make it sound. So you'll find Lithuanian websites which dispute the numbers. It wasn't thousands of Jews. It was a few Jews. And there's no documentation. You know, you go that route. Uh, second, you take the following uh, uh, path. It was regrettable. But the Jews brought it upon themselves by being pro-communist and welcoming Stalin. This is a staple of the historiography of the Lithuanian right wing. Now, the fact that it's not true, that as small a percentage of Jews did what he just went communist, as a percentage of Lithuanians, doesn't matter to them. You know what I'm saying? Let's say it was 2% of the Jews in Lithuania did this, or 3%. No, 2-3% of Lithuanians, non-Jews as well. No, but the Jews all get killed. Really? Let me get this straight. Some Jews welcome Stalin. So you shoot them all? All Jews? You raped teenage girls and threw them into burning lime? You shot women and children because some Jews welcomed Stalin? Really? You understand what I'm saying? Is, is, that, is that your position? Thirdly, it was a tiny, unrepresented group of good old boys. In other words, you go like this. Unfortunately, there were a couple of Lithuanians that did it. They're not the rope. It was a small group. They're, they're unrepresented. It was a criminal element, something like that. It's very unfortunate. The rest of us feel bad about it. But it wasn't us. The nation at whole is not responsible for what the few did. This is a possible taina. However, that would mean that you're telling me you regard them as criminals and will prosecute the perpetrators, many of whom were alive in 1990. It was only 45 years after the war. But Lithuania didn't want to do that. And so Lithuania stalled for the next 20 years, allowing the perpetrators to die natural deaths. You understand know what I'm saying, right? People who did in the 40s, by the time you get to the year 2000, by the time you get 2010, what are they, 90s? You know, they're all, they're all gone anyway. In addition, to sort of turn the tables, Lithuania demanded the extradition of Jewish perpetrators who were in the NKVD. Okay? So take a look at the next one. This is very interesting. These are very well-known pictures in Lithuania. The guy on the left-hand side was a forest brother, one of the big heroes of fighting against Stalin. The guy in the middle, his name is Nachman Dushansky, was a Lithuanian Jew converted to communism, became a big, big macher in the NKVD and KGB, especially after the war, and he was put in charge by Stalin of hunting down these forest uh, uh, brothers. You see? And he had a special detachment, and they eventually got this guy on the left in 1955 or something like that and tortured him to death, 56. And so the guy on the left is like a big Lithuanian national hero, and naturally a Jew did it. What happened to this guy, Dushansky? He had his career in the Stalin KGB and eventually retired. And then to his surprise, <laughs> the Soviet Union fell apart. And he went to Israel, made Aliyah. Sometime in the 90s, Lithuania said, well, he's a war criminal. We want him back for torturing you know, our, our people. And let's put it this way. Israel said, we ain't sending another Jew back unless we wanted to get killed by Lithuania. You already killed enough. But on the other hand, it's not so push that you hear where the Lithuanians are coming from. But they're doing this to establish a moral equivalence. That's the question. Is there a moral equivalence to what I just described with one Jew? Did it say this guy? Because most of the 99% of people in Stalin's secret police were not Jewish. To the fact that the Lithuanians shot every man, woman, and child. Is that the same thing? Right? This became part of the general Lithuanian strategy, what they call double genocide. Some moral equivalence. You know, listen, the right wing Lithuania will say like this Look, the, the Jews went through a bummer, and we did too. You suffered under Hitler, we suffered under Stalin. So let's forget the whole darn thing. You know, 
let's move on. Let's not talk about it. You get it? Um, now, the Jews aren't built that way. The Jews say, no. Are you comparing what a few Jews like this Dushansky did to the murder of 95% of Lithuanian Jewry at your hands, you mumsers? The Lithuanian says, yes, we are. And the Jews say, no, it's not the same. Lithuanians, in the middle of the spectrum, your typical average middle-of-the-road Lithuanian said like this, look, for a thousand years, the Jews had a good Lithuanian. We had a good, we had a good thousand years. And then came that lousy six months. You know, can't we sort of like skip to six months <laughs> within the context of a thousand years? You understand? Why let six months spoil everything? Let's be friends. Uh, and Lithuania is a nice country. 99% of the time, they were good to Jews. Then unfortunately, there was a, the second half of 1941. But other than that, everything was good. The Jews say, that was one heck of a six months. In addition, what is the image in, in the world of the LAF, which I talked about last week, the Lithuanian Activist Front, which had the original uprising against Stalin in 1941, and the Forrest Brothers. The Lithuanians, these are heroes. This is a key component of Lithuanian anti-Russian discourse. These guys tried to resist Stalin's brutality, which is true. Putin, though, clever guy, will never say Russia ever made a mistake. <laughs> and so Putin says, these guys, like the Forrest Brothers, were not heroes, they were fascists. Look what they did to the Jews. You see? So Russia, cynically, uses the Lithuanian anti-Semitic past to discredit all of Lithuanian nationalism. This, this is a game Russia is playing. It has nothing to do with us, particularly. We're just like little you know, chess pieces in it. This enrages Lithuanians, whose self-image of rape victims of Stalin is a constituent element of their national identity. So let's go to the next one. Relativizing the Stalin-Hitler pact by what Putin does. He said, well, listen, you know, you guys were bad. You know, Stalin did bad things, so you guys did bad things. That's like trivializing the Holocaust for the Jews. No, no, no. The Stalin-Hitler pact was like the arch devil. You know, it's the greatest evil in history to the Lithuanians. You see? So these are prisoners of history. But for the sheriffs of Plato, for the Jews, the Red Army, Stalin's army, were liberators. That's a fact. Which sticks in the craw of the Lithuanians. How can you say it was a good thing that the Russian army came back in Lithuania? A Jew will say, yes, damn right. Otherwise, they're going to kill my father. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> what, what, what are you talking about? I should be against Stalin? Stalin saved my life. I know he's bad to other people, but he saved me. You see? And you guys killed me. Meanwhile, the state of Israel is stuck. Israel wants to have good relations with Lithuania, which consistently votes for Israel and the UN and elsewhere. Look, here's Bibi, went recently to Vilna. I listen to his words. He's very uh, statesmanlike. It's very moving for my wife, Sarah, and me to be here today with you in the Choral Synagogue with the Foreign Minister of Lithuania, Linus, a great friend. I want to thank you, Linus, for standing up for Israel and the truth in European forums, for telling your colleagues the service that Israel performs in saving so many European lives by our resourceful and brave intelligence people, we have saved so many European lives in so many countries. Israel, in many ways, is the defender of Europe, and it's time that Europe understood this. So, does Bibi saying what a, what a political leader has to say? Because he wants to maintain good relations with Lithuania, because you need them you know, in the European Union, United Nations, and all that kind of stuff. And yet, so from Bibi's point of view, and he, he's not stupid, he's a Lithuanian himself. He knows the Lithuanian shot everybody. But he's saying, listen, we're in 2020, we got to move on, we need the help now of Lithuania. The same way Ben Green spoke about Germany. The trouble is, we Jews are like the famous character Funius El Morioso. Remember from, who was it? Uh, from Borges, right? The guy who cannot forget. <laughs> cannot forget anything. That's who we are. We're cursed. 
That's it. That's the Jews are. Forever, we're going to talk about the fact that in front of us, they rounded up and shot him in a ditch. It was a next door neighbor. That's, and that's who we are. BB cannot deny the past. He doesn't. But he tries to massage it. And I, for, for political, for, for statesmen like reason whenever possible. Go to the next one. Remember that guy I showed you, the Forrest brother who was killed by the Dushansky guy a minute ago? So the Russians said that he was anti Semitic. They participated in the killing of Jews in, in June to December of 41. Therefore, he's not be a hero by the list of ways, he should be a villain. In this particular case, if I have the story right, it's very complicated. If I have the story right, then it turned out that it wasn't true. And in order to show that it wasn't true, the Israeli ambassador went to the house of his daughter to meet with her, to give her a heksher. And, and, and what he was saying is, Israel, in Lithuania, Israel honors the memory of the Forest Brothers who didn't hurt the Jews. We don't honor the memory of those who, who were part of the good old boys and shot all the Jews. They're a bunch of mamzeim, they can burn in hell. But the ones who didn't, we understand them as, as Lithuanian independence fighters. And this, I got on a Lithuanian website, not on the Jewish. You understand? It's very important to them to say our national hero is not have a tarnished past. But they can only say it about Ramanas, Ramana, Ramanatas. You spelled that right. Ramanatas, however it's spelled. Uh, there are plenty of others who were forest brothers and all stuff who were and do have Jewish blood in their hands. Right? Many of them are anti-Semitic murderers. And this clashes with Lithuania's desire to, to glorify them. So every time, if you follow this in the papers, uh, no reason that you should, if you follow the news, every time in Lithuania they name a street or erect a statue, there's a clash between Lithuanians and Jews. Because they'll name it after this guy. For example, this guy Skirpo, who I mentioned last time, was the head of the uh, LAF, who was a friend of Hitler. So they named the street after him. To all Jews raise hell. The Simon Wiesnall Center. And the Lithuanians say, no, he's a national hero by us. So it's like Khmelnytsky, you get it? You and I are experiencing this in the United States now as they're tearing down the statues of Robert E. Lee and perhaps George Washington. To the Southerners, he's a hero. To the Blacks, he's a villain. Which is true. Which is true. You see? So it's very complicated. And it boils down to the fact that we have an open sore in memory and uh, history between Lithuanians and Jews. Meanwhile, in Lithuania, recently, the right-wing parties have been winning the elections. And as a result, discourse has become very right-wing and suppressive. A million Lithuanians have emigrated since 1990. You hear that? That's a gigantic number, gone to the West. Because they don't like the extreme right-wing, xenophobic atmosphere in the country. The young, the well-educated, the best of them, move out. This does not bode well for the future. Okay? And so recently, you had a very interesting business that that um, uh, meeting at Yad Vashem, which had all the world leaders there, was not attended by the president of Lithuania. Go to the next one. Look at this headline. President of Lithuania did not attend Yad Vashem because Putin was honored. And then Putin represents Russia, and Russia was the one who raped Lith Lithuania, which is true. And look what it says. Gitanas Noseda, whatever his name is, cancels participation in Holocaust Forum, saying because the Polish president was allowed to speak, and Putin was. Lithuania's president will not attend the forum, being boycotted Polish amid a row with Russia over Poland's role in World War II. President, uh, a Polish president Duda backed off. Uh, now, I understand why Poland does it, and they're not wrong. The Russians are blackening everybody's name to make Russia look good, because Russia doesn't want to say, well, we had Stalin. So Putin is reinventing history for his own reason. So look at Lithuanian Jewry and this whole subject about football in the Cold War now that's going on. He would thus not have an opportunity to respond when Putin uses keynote speech to level accusations. Poland had colluded with Nazi Germany in the outbreak of World War II. Okay, uh, go on. The forum will mark 75 years. And uh, anyway, we, we can skip this. The bottom line is that it's a political football. And now listen to this. Putin, who is a world leader, went to Yad Vashem. And they gave him covered malachim. They treated him very well. And Putin made a whole speech in which he acknowledged the Holocaust because why not the Russians didn't do it. And makes the point in the little uh, piece I'm sharing with you Hitler uh, didn't do it by himself. Hitler did it with the help of the locals. See what he's doing in speech? I'm saying he's tarring Lithuanians in the polls. But I'm asking you a question. Is he wrong? Is he wrong? Listen to Putin. 
crimes perpetrated by Nazis, their carefully thought through, planned, final solution to the Jewish question, as they called it. That is, colleagues, it's one of the blackest, the most shameful pages in the world history. Nor should we forget that this crime had accomplices whose cruelty often surpassed that of their masters. Those death factories and concentration camps were operated not just by Nazis, but by their henchmen and accomplices in many European countries. It's where these thugs operated in the occupied territories of the Soviet Union that the biggest number of Jews were slain. Only Ukraine, 1.4 million Jews were slaughtered. In Lithuania, 220,000 people. I like to draw your attention to the fact that that is 95% of the pre-war Jewish population of Lithuania. So all of a sudden, Putin cares about the Lithuanian Holocaust. He wants to stick it to the Lithuania, because that's part of the Cold War politics that's going over there. Let me conclude by saying that in 2020, which is when we're giving this talk, Lithuania is passing a law, or I think they did, criminalizing anyone who says Lithuania participated in the Holocaust. Hey, you go to jail if you say that. Because they're so ticked off by this. And I know what they mean. They'll say it like this. Lithuania didn't contribute to the Holocaust. Maybe a couple Lithuanians did. You know, like that. Uh, what is the future? When you're really asking is, what is the future of the past, of the narrative? What's the future of the narrative? The, this open sore may fester and get worse, which will not be good for the Jews in Israel, in my opinion, because that means the Lithuanians eventually take the heck with it and they'll join the anti you know, they'll join the PLO or whatever, I don't know. Or possibly as time passes, Lithuania may admit its past. But I don't see that in the immediate cards. This is what I mean when I describe this subject, Lithuanians and Jews, as glory, horror, and revisionist history. There's a lot more to talk about. They're, they're getting rid of the Vilna Cemetery and all that. But we are out of time. I think I've given you the basics. And for the rest, you'll have to go on your own. On that complicated note, we adjourn, sign a die. Good evening.